different feeling in the time where you start by But in a way you do it, I love it that you say I don't deny Also wanna hear the demand, you know I know the mind Because you are my baby, because you are my Because you are my baby, because you are my
Oh, who thought the nice music?
Hi, Dad. Hi. Hi, everybody. Hello. You all hear me? Yeah, we do. Yeah, we can hear you. Wait, oh, okay. What, what, you all hear me what, now? What, 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 why is your backdrop the opposite way? Oh, I see the right way. I have, but, but we see it the wrong way. <laughs> really? Mm -hmm. It's it's flipped around. Uh -huh. okay, let me let me, let me, yes, let me fix that. I, 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 need, I, I need you're going to screw something up today before the call. Thank God that's only thing you screwed up. <laughs> See if you have my kind of backdrop. Even if it flips around, nobody will know. Yeah, this 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 looks better. If it was if it was administering propofol, you'd have done it perfectly by now, and killed Michael Jackson. <laughs> Yes, this is better. All right. Hi, Teddy. Hello, Ace. How are you? Taladeo. <laughs> Hi, no. Hi, Joe. Uh, and everybody uh, else. I can see Maureen. And um, where's is, where is the other Ace? Oh, there he is. Hi. I'm can here. we see yeah. your face apart from the, this still picture? With past tense yeah, yeah. on your chest. <laughs> all, right, all right, good. Let, yeah. me, let me keep quiet now. All right, all right guys. So let's, uh, uh, it's what? 11.06. Let's wait four more minutes. And okay. then we can get started. Okay. So and, sure. yeah, in the interim, I'll play, I'll play some more music and we'll wait. Oh, great. Good. All right. All right. Sure. sure. If I can find the music. <laughs> Hello, folks. Good afternoon from now. Maybe you need a background turn the opposite way to find the music. <laughs> no. Really? I did my door, I need explanation to show tell me. You know, be hypo, that way I may know the air about you. Not in the way you do it, I know you tell me, say I know they lie. If you know there be nobody, they over me, me, yeah, you probably got to get you on my baby. Because you want my baby, you probably got to get you on my baby. You want my baby, you probably got to get you on my baby. Because you are my baby, you probably want to get you are my baby. You are my baby, you want to get you are my baby. You are my baby, you want to get you are my baby. You are my baby, you want to get you are my baby. You are my baby, you want to get you are my baby.
So good morning, everybody. Um, those in the US and good afternoon to those in Ghana. Um, and welcome to everybody around the world joining us today for uh, this very first uh, reading session with friends. Uh, I'm gonna mute everybody initially, and then I would uh, mute the, the panelists on here, have them introduce themselves, and then we can get going. Uh, it's 10 minutes after the top of the hour. And I think we need to get started so we can go through at least uh, two rounds of uh, uh, poetry, essays, or short stories. Uh, my name is Nana Daziganza, and I have a few friends here with me today uh, who are going to share with you their writing. Um, I'll go ahead and unmute um, the panelists. Hey, so go ahead and unmute Anna. Um, Teddy. Uh, which of the aces? You always have to determine. Uh, Haven, <laughs> big ace and little ace. <laughs> Teddy. And uh, I think uh, at this point, I'll ask each of you to sort of introduce yourself uh, short way and then we get started. Let's start with Joe. Okay, great. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can. Perfect. Okay, so um, my name is Joanne Ketia. I am a, a poet and I'm a medical sonographer by profession. Yeah. And uh, Anna, you want to do us the honor? Good morning, or actually good afternoon. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's perfect. I'm Anna Rujic Do. Um, I met Nana about 20 some years ago and we've sort of reconnected over the years in a variety of ways, but more recently creatively. And I'm actually really excited to be here today. Awesome. Um, hey, Ben Ace. Yeah, <clears throat> my name is Ben Ace. Um, a writer, a poet, a pan lover, and then a spoken word artist as well. <laughs> yeah. All right, then, big ace. Um, how, how big? <laughs> Hi, <laughs> my, name, my name is Ace, I'm Kumar. Uh, I, I'm told I'm an attorney. I, I'm just someone who speaks my mind. I think that's for that. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, and I've, known, and I've known Nana since 12th October, 1979. We actually oh, remember yeah. the day we met for the first time, 12th October, 1979. And um, yes, uh, the, the rest of the stuff will come out as we speak. But as, as you might notice, I have no kind word to say about him. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm Nana Daziganza. Um, I've, like I said, I've known Ace for, for so long. I've, I've known Anna for a long time. She actually did some photography at her wedding, where it was no good. Um, I just enjoy reading Teddy's work. I found out actually that Teddy and my brother-in-law are classmates from my mother's school. Yeah, um, yeah. And uh, I, I, I just love Aiden's just love work. It. And uh, I'm getting to know Joe's work and love it. And she's a medical sonographer. And most people don't realize it, but as an anesthesiologist, we do a fair bit amount of echocardiography and sonography too. So we all seem to share something there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So this is how this is going to go. Um, each, each of us is going to get about five to six minutes to read a piece. And then we'll move on to the next person. After the first round, we'll, give, we'll leave the flow open for questions and discussions. And then we'll go to the second round. I'm hoping we'll go through at least two um, rounds. And my pieces are short, so that might give time for maybe another round, the third round. And so without further ado, let's get going. Let's start with Joe. So, um, Hi, thank you. Uh, full disclosure, I don't know what anyone is going to um, read. Mm, and yeah. it's all original material. Okay, so let's get going. Okay, so um, my first is a, is a poetry and it's entitled Dead Lovers. So here we go. The ghosts of dead lovers with hunting memories unpacked sorries and the conversations with the end for days and hours and years were not determined our future. 
they will not show up at our doorsteps uninvited, whether or not a new lover walked into our lives holding promises of life, of sweet scented perfume and gentle rhythms like the night we dance all alone to our favorite songs. They will be buried over and over again if they show up at all the hours of the night where our desires, like catching a fever, keep surging, where our wands are clouded with images of imaginary lovers, they will be buried again and again. With no laying in state, not another moment of mourning will be heard from our silent lips. Our mothers will not shed tears over dry skeletons, for dead lovers have places where they belong, and those places are not here. They do not reside in our smiles or laughter or grin or anger or desperation or our fears. They do not hold any right to be near us or breathe into the same life around us. They belong to places their touch are remembered and their faces captured in full, but it will not be on our beds where we have stayed up most nights waiting for the call that never came through. It will not be, on, it will not be in our bathroom singing on top of our lungs, heartbreaking songs that do not only break our hearts, but crushes our knees and ankles, clavicles and wombs, songs that shrinks our nerves and tendons until every cell in our body begs to be cleansed with gallons of water enough to drown us into our own baptism, enough to drown us into surrendering, enough to make us flow like rivers. They will not show up when we are moving in or moving on or moving out. They simply do not belong and will not shower us with broken promises that begs us to stay when they have watched us leave. They will not deceive us to trust the face of an old enemy than a new friend because we know too well that life grants gifts in unexpected places and healing takes after wildflowers and the dead must be left to die over and over and over and over again if they dare show up in places where new life is beginning. Thank you. <laughs> that is amazing. That is really Thank amazing. you. Thank you. And, Thank uh, you. So we'll, we'll come back to that. And without further ado, let's move on to Anna. Um, okay, this is called uh, In Translation. Can you still hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. Um, in Translation. I am fluent, they say, whoever they are, as we carry on a discourse on the human kind. Kindness, they say, does not protect us, and evolution maintains that we bury our weak ones, but I was weak once. And a stranger called me her child and explained a dagger from a knife as she put them aside to symbolize that my story was not done. I am fluent, they say, whoever they are. As I tell them about mitochondria, which is plural, in fact, of a Latin noun, of once a modern tongue, born of the ashes of Sparta and Athena, but to us a dead one, I am fluent. They <laughs> say that I sound Russian. And I shiver, don't they know that I am a descendant of an oppressor and perhaps of Attila the Hun from the powder keg of the Balkans, but I'm not Russian. I am a child of the oppressed too. And isn't it all relative to a little drop in time in this great timeline of existence? I carry the power of the terrorist and the terrorized in my mitochondria. I am fluent, they say. In our pack, we're no better than an unkindness of ravens as we hunt together like a band of coyotes in the shadows alone like a shadow of jaguars to eat their weak ones, they, whoever they are, will return one day for our descendants and we will go dare call them a terrorist and so on to infinity like a pack of hyenas. Yes, I know they'll come as a cackle, but does it matter right now as we justify to absurdity the taking of a life? What if, while you drown in fear of me, I called you my son, and taught you to hold a scalpel instead of a gun and taught you to pronounce mitochondria in a language that was once not ours, but is now our common one. Thank you. Wow. That's amazing. Wow, Anna. Yeah. That, that, that statement got me. They say we should. 
they say we should bury the week, but I was week one. Wow. Mm. <laughs> that was deep. Anyway, yeah. let's keep going. <clears throat> Even eight. Yeah. I would, I, would, I would take a different turn with a short story. Mine is a short story. <clears throat> Good guy. The morning after Benua had buried her six-year-old daughter, she drowned herself in tears in her single room, questioning God why and why he couldn't save the life of her dear angel. In her rantings, she cares her stars for the dreadful day. Benua proceeded to bathe herself in sand on the compound of her family house. She wailed, wailed, and called upon the ghost of her dead mother. A week on, the weeping and ranting ceased after steadily dwindling, but deep down her heart, she hadn't healed from her loss. She roamed from one day to the other to find the root cause of her daughter's demise. In the space of one month, Benyo had visited six different pastors, five traditional priests, four herbalists, and two self-acclaimed ritualists to see who and what killed her daughter. Three of the pastors didn't see any foreign cause of her daughter's demise aside the postmortem report. She debunked whatever these pastors asserted and called the report a scam to cover the true cause of her daughter's demise. The other three pastors suggested a week of fasting and prayers, but a passionate food lover as Benua, she couldn't resist letting food into her belly, let alone pray. Two of the traditional priests concluded that Benue's eldest sister was the main force behind the cause of her daughter's demise. These conclusions were nothing to draw sense from to Benue because she was the eldest child of her, of her, of her mother. She rained insults at the priest and colored them well with the best of fiery words her anger could produce. One of the priests swore to cast an incredible spell of coronavirus on Benue if she dared cross the path of displeasing his gods. Benua called on him three times, boasted of its impossibility, and asked him to inhale the coronavirus she had just let out through her cough. For the two self-acclaimed ritualists, the least said the better. One proposed bathing Benua at night in his room, naked with a bucket of sanctified water to reveal whoever killed her daughter. Benua agreed at the least sound of his voice. Anything to get the killer, she was ready and in at all costs. The night came for the spiritual bathing. The ritualist took Benua to his bathroom and began to undress himself. He asked Benua to do the same, and she obliged. Before we begin, I would have to have an erotic encounter with you. That's how the spirit can enter you first, he established. Ah! Benua stood disordered in her mind. She resisted the, in the initial stage, but upon further convention, she agreed and allowed him have his way for the intended purpose. Three days within which Benya was told she would dream continuously of her daughter's killer. All she dreamt of was she being chased by different animals each night. On the third night, she was chased by a snow, a snow ridiculous. She got fed up after the third ritualist requested for an amount of money she couldn't come by even if she had to sell the family house. Benya almost gave up so her friend recommended a powerful spiritualist to her. This woman, hmm, she can see tomorrow from today and yesterday from tomorrow. I have tried and can attest that she <laughs> is the powerful person to reveal the cause of your daughter's death. The friend affirmed, without a voice of doubt, Benua agreed to visit the powerful spiritualist. She spent three days in the presence of the spiritualist and returned on an afternoon with a gang in the community to her family house to bring allegations against her 90-year-old grandmother. They had clubs, broken sticks, cutlasses, and anything solid that could cause harm in the attack. You witch, you are the cause of everyone's woes in the community. You killed the daughter and you have the nerve to live. Benua spat fire at her grandmother who had just exited her room after taking a warm bath in the afternoon. A stout guy dragged the edge of a cutlass on the ground and it got grandma shivering. She stared at the mob before her and questioned Benua, but her thin voice was swept under the heavy field voices of these youth. Her wrinkles deepened suddenly. The usual beautiful look in her face faded. Her gray hair were the only thing that crowned her head on this gloomy moment. Which they continued the rage and promised to send the old lady to her grave. Two guys heckled the old lady and dragged her on the floor on her feeble feet out of the compound towards the town square. 
She was held amid the shouting, saw words, and these disgruntled youth never gave up. They raised their weapons high in the distance to despair. The old lady paused tries and begged for her bony weak ankles, but not a single soul heeded. Tears were too dry to walk down her eyes. Her past flashed through her mind, and the future depressed her soul. She had lived the beginning of her life, but her end was too near to escape. She dreamt of a day death would pay a visit to her weak soul down the feet of men, but never did she imagine it would end this bitter without a crown of glory. Finally, they arrived at a mini platform at the center of the community. The old lady was pushed to the cemented floor and asked to confess her sins before being killed. She went to meet for five minutes and asked Benua to forgive her, but she didn't heed. Benua called her a witch. A long creep flew a distance and landed on her back. It left bruises on her, on her tender skin in just a single strike. She bowed her head, raised it, and pleaded. Benua, leader of the gang, held the piece of belt and encircled her grandmother. She swirled one end of the belt behind her to attempt a strike, but it was held behind her when she powered her arm to, lear, to lash her grandmother. You don't want to do that. A deep voice behind him commanded. Benua turned and it was the chief priest of the land. She went on to ask the priest to consult the girls to pronounce the old lady a witch. The crowd hailed. I will do that. But before I do, would you tell your gang how you left your daughter in the house for three days to follow your boyfriend to a party when she needed medical attention? Who is the witch? When she was hospitalized for three days, how many times did you visit her till she was pronounced dead? Who is the witch? The crowd murmured. You people say she is the cause of your struggle. Yes, everyone exclaimed. Yao Dui, you, you who is lazy as a sick tortoise, you say this woman is a witch? Abinan Choba, tell me how many children haven't you aborted aside the five I know of, and I'll consult my gods. Muniru, how many times haven't your father secured jobs for you, but you, as an intelligent kleptomaniac, you get stuck? Jai Jesu, should I tell these people how many times you mix fine broken glasses in your husband's soup to slowly send him to his father's grave? Today, you have, you have the strength to say the woman who held your mother and yourself from the womb at birth is a witch. The champion voice of these youth had grown lame along the secrets revealed by the chief priest. Hmm, Kabo, the man beside you, whom you call a bosom friend, is the father of your three children, if your wife hasn't told you. Hey, a section of the crowd screamed. Now, if any of you wants to reach this woman through whom some of you wouldn't have been born, if not for experience in childbirth, reach me first, and the gods would announce their rage. Take a step towards me, and I would be told, and you would be told stories by your fathers tonight. The priest swore and raised the metal bar decorated with the red cloth. The crowd dispersed within minutes. The priest saw it today that the old lady was unharmed till she departed at four years after in her peaceful sleep. Thank you. Wow. Wow. Great story. Great story, Evan. All right. Now let's move on over to Teddy. And uh, everybody, you remember, there'll be questions after this round. So. Yes, Nana. Um, hello. Uh, I didn't get the chance to introduce myself, if you notice. <laughs> yes, oh, I apologize. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> so please yeah. go ahead and do that. Yeah, so um, I'm Teddy Totima. I live in Accra. I, I work at the University of Ghana Medical Center. And um, on a good day, when I'm disciplined enough, I write what I think. And uh, I've ended with... Um, poems, with short stories. Um, I'm really inspired by writers writing and the power of the written word. So thank you, Nana, for having me. You're welcome. So we have right. two surgeons on here. We have Anna, Anna, who's a pediatric surgeon, and you, who's a neurosurgeon. Yeah. Yes. We Anna. forgive you. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I'll, I'll start with this one, which I would call a portico, <laughs> because it's a poem and an article at the same time, and it's called Ghana. 
Ghana is beautiful if you pause long enough to see the color in the squalor, to sample the order in the odors, to feel the humor in the clamor, to hear the cheer in the air, to see the light in the lights out, to see the bukum in the banku, to tolerate the tattle in the trotro, to appreciate the patience of a people waiting to progress. Mm. We have come a long way in 64 years, and yet in some ways we have gone nowhere. We still wait to progress. We still struggle with the rest of the bottom third world hustling for pickings the West will shed. Running in circles, cupping hand, the world flies, we're stuck on land. Ghana is wonderful. If you value walking along the streets without your heart missing a beat, the car breaks down by the road, there's always some passerby to lighten the load. The kinky, the fish, the aroma, the spice, the chop bar, the bush meat, the soup that never dries, the blessing of a smile from the stranger, the unsolicited greeting dispelling danger, the music, the beat, the azonto, the pride, the soccer, the flag, the fiver side. We struggled for independence to make for ourselves a land of freedom, a gateway to opportunity. Now here we are, 64 years so far. We do not have enough power to light every home, every hour. We can't even afford the medicine that brands our sick healing. Ghana is paradise if we each own it and commit to it. If we each reserve something for it. If we dig the gold out of the rock around and treasure it and feed the ground so our land continues to better lives and the gold is sold so Ghana thrives. So our children will love the Ghana we know because we made this country something to show to a world increasingly doubtful of the less developed, a gem, a star, a diamond refined, enveloped in hard work and perseverance and fellowship and smiles and victory and friendship. Ghana is beautiful. Thank you. Wow. Wow. That's thank beautiful. You, Teddy, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. So we go to Big H now. Uh, well, and when, when Teddy, Teddy reads something that's so positive, and I look at what I'm about to read, anyway. <laughs> then don't read it. <laughs> <laughs> um, let, let me start with something which I wrote on 5th July 2016 and almost sounds as a prophecy of what we do now and the effect of the lockdown. So I wrote, so I'll just read two quick pieces and within the six minute time limit. It's that some face-to-face -face meetings are absolutely unnecessary and a painful waste of time. Gosh, especially when what is said at the meeting could have been said in one two minute phone call or via email or even WhatsApp. Get real, this is the Uber age. You should sit in traffic all the way into that meeting only if that is required. Else, drop me a mail, call my phone, send me a text. When I feel unwell, I send a WhatsApp message to my doctor, Radha Hackman, the no nonsense, if it itches, scratch it person. Message back, sort it. It is only if that doesn't work that I go to see her on appointment, set date and time. She sent her bill, her services and for free. I pay, simples. And by all means, and you may take this however you want to, do not appear without an appointment. Unless you are dying or I am, all you will get is an appointment to come back later. Now, so when COVID started and we were compelled to do this, 
I went back to this reading and said, hmm, that was almost prophetic, but this was in my usual style. I'll read the second one, which I think is one of my best writings so far. It is, I wrote this on 20, uh, January 2016, and it's entitled Baba the Black Sheep. May I get a tad controversial? Baba Black Sheep, have you any wool? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Or master, three bags full. One for the master, one for the dame, one for the little boy who lives down the lane. I don't believe, as some have alleged, that this poem has racist undertones. Nah, it's just a nursery rhyme. But there are eight lessons that I learned from it all by accident. First, he's just called Baba, an onomatopoeic, onomatopoeic, uh, it's onomatopoeic because he is only known for the noise he makes, not his true worth. So his name is just Baba because that's the noise he makes. Second, Baba himself has no value for or sees precious little worth in his most invaluable product, wool, which is required to keep others warm in cold climes. It is nothing to him because, after all, nature has schemed to make him always grow more. After shedding three bags full, he is too willing to give it away. Third, when asked about wool, he does not say a simple yes or no as the owner of the product. He waxes into studied and practiced obedience twice. Yes, sir. Next, first time, yes, sir. Next time, yes, sir. Three bags full. He has deep respect for the questioner, the potential user of his product. So he repeats, yes, sir, just in case the questioner didn't hear him, or to emphasize his willingness to give of his rule. Fourth, and without any further questioning, Baba explains, one for the master. That's apart from addressing a sir, he also has a master, a lord, a controller, with a natural right to one bag full, one bag, one full bag of wool. Fifth, the second bag is for the dame, a woman of title or rank. So Baba does not only serve a master, he serves a dame. Madame Dame gets a full bag too. What a man deserves, a woman deserves too. Fair, square. Sixth, it is the third bag, third full bag that kills me. It is for some little boy who lives down the lane. Little boy whose only entitlement to a full bag of wool is that he lives down the lane. Seventh, we are not told that the master, dame, and little boy pay Baba for the wool. By the way, who pays sheep for what they have? And so whenever you hear that the prices of gold, cocoa, bauxite, crude oil, etc., are down on the so-called international market, remember that those prices are not determined by you and I into whose land God bequeathed those assets, but, af but that after we have satisfied masters and dames, the price will be determined by a little boy working on some mercantile exchange. Eighth, and most painfully, yes, Baba the sheep is black. Thank you. <laughs> so um, thanks, Ace. So I guess now it's my turn, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm going to try and squeeze two pieces also in my six minute time allotment. My pieces are a little short, so I guess I might be able to do that. Let me uh, reset the clock and start it. My first piece is titled A Conversation with My Son. I wrote this about a year ago, and um, I, I just think it fits the world we live in now. So here we go. I want to tell my son the world is a welcoming place, but I can't. I want to tell my son that the color of his skin does not matter, but I can't. I want to tell my son he will be judged by the content of his character, but I can't. I want to call my, tell my son all the doors will be open, but I can't. I want to tell my son there will be no prejudice and bias, but I can't. I want to tell my son he won't be judged for walking across the street, for running, for driving, for singing, for dancing, for being in his own apartment, but I honestly can't. I want to tell him traffic stops are harmless, but I can't. Mm. I want to tell my son he won't face daily indignities because of his ebony hue, but I can't. I want to tell my son he does not need to be picture perfect to make it, but I can't. I want to tell him that if he ever slips and has to face a judge, he won't be sentenced based on the color of his skin, 
his name, the nappiness of his hair or the flatness of his nose, but I can't. I want to tell my son that they see our humanity, but I honestly, honestly can't. So I can only love him, hold him, hug him, and hope. I want to tell him that the dear Lord will look out for him, but I can't. So I can only love him, hold him, hug him, and hope. And bask in the joy and happiness anytime he comes through the door and let my heart soar anytime he returns home in one piece. Then I only hope that one day I don't have to identify him. I only hope that one day I expect him to walk through that door and he can't. I can only hope that the last sounds he hears are not the sounds of his life rushing out of him, chased out by hate, prejudice, and lead. Then when I want to tell him I love him, then I definitely can. This second piece, uh, it's a piece I wrote about four years ago. It's titled, uh, Just Get Over It. You find it so unfair, a target you seem to wear. For to drive is but a gauntlet between blue lights and a bullet. Makes you wonder if your color gives off a dark punitive order. Yet all you seem to hear is, hey, just get over it. The city streets you pound for a job you hound. Yet not a door will open, then that color is a bad omen. That hovers like a bad spell no one can dispel. Don't ask for you here. Hey, just get over it. He likes the way you move, puts him in the group. His advances are turn offs. Those demands make you scoff. The harassment you have to bear for the career you declare. Think you find any pity? Hey, just get over it. Don't commit a crime, for then you do time. That is colored in severity and darker in intensity. For justice in this land is not colorblind. However, if you must, hey, just get over it. When you call the shots, you don't tie yourself in knots over how others live or even try to survive. Empathy is a luxury, it's projects a drudgery. Much easier it is to say, hey, just get over it. Thank you. Wow. So that is the end of the first round. And, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, we'll do a little bit of questions and discussions, maybe take some questions from uh, uh, our participants uh, who have any. Um, so I'll start with Joe. Joe, how long have you been writing? <laughs> um, so I think I've been writing as much as I can remember since age five. Yeah. Okay. I, I started so writing from, from age oh, five. Sorry. Okay, what informs your writing? What 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 pushes you? Okay, so um, I I think I think I, I take inspiration from anything anything that inspires me. I often tell people I'm not the kind of writer that you tell write about this and then I am able to write. It's it's like it's just an inspiration that hits me, and I'm just lucky that it's often very consistent because every day anything inspires me from narratives of people's life my own life what I'm going through what someone is going through the sky inspires me something that somebody said like anything that has to do with life inspires me so that is what I draw my inspiration when it comes to writing yeah right so Eben I'll ask you the same what what kind of inspires you yeah um just like Joe said anything actually inspires me for instance when it comes to um, short stories, I try to drag single happenings or real life happenings and then put non-fiction or fictional parts to it to make it a, bit, um, a, a long story. I could be walking on the road and see people, two people fighting. I may not know what actually would, is the cause of the fight, but then seeing that alone, I'm able to pick it up and then draw fictional thoughts of fictional scenes from one point to the very point of day fighting and even to a point of day not um, to an end of a story. When it comes to poetry, mostly um, pictures inspire me. When I see, you know, when um, you're, you're a friend of mine on Facebook, you know, every poem that I write, I mostly add a picture. So I see pictures, when everybody see a picture, when everybody see a drawing, I see words, I kind of draw what this picture speaks, the voice of the picture, and then translates it into poetry. And then aside that, anything, I could, I could just be then anything else, any situation, any instance, or any happening could trigger a poem or a story. 
And I do as much as possible to jot them down and then later get back to them anytime to make it a full story or full poem. All right. So Teddy, um, thanks a lot, Evan. Where do you squeeze in the right? And as, as a neurosurgeon uh, working in a busy practice, uh, where, where do you squeeze in the time? You know, um, there's always that, you know, evening when um, one finishes a little early and can sit down to write something. Um, also, there's sometimes the weekend where you finish a bit earlier than you would have thought you'd finish. Um, and, and sometimes it's also now that you have our phones are so capable, it's when we're waiting to start a procedure or waiting to to you know do something medical and so there are quite a few windows um, that can be taken advantage of it's all about how disciplined one can be and actually if I was a bit more disciplined I'll be writing much more <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. wow okay <laughs> All right. Well, thanks. I, I'll go. That, that that takes me to Anna, another another surgeon here. Um, so Anna and I actually were we have been planning for years to collaborate and work on um, material about displacement and uh, immigration and things like that. And I'm glad um, we've been able to put put this together. And uh, um, I, I know what informs her, right? And I I wanted to tell all of us also. So Anna, I mean, what informs your writing? I think you need to unmute. Better? Yes, much better. Um, I think that's changed over time. You know, I've always, I, 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 unlike, um, I think somebody mentioned this earlier, um, maybe Teddy, um, or, or, or maybe it was Joe, um, that it's difficult to write, you know, if somebody tells you, hey, write about this, um, it's difficult to come up with the writing. Um, but that, that is actually how I started, um, how I learned English, how, um, you know, there was a topic and I had to write. And at the end of that, um, it became very stiff. It was something that you turned into school and it didn't really it didn't stay with me. I, I, it's something that to me was immediately forgettable. Um, and so when I was able to actually think about things that matter to me and write them down, that's when I figured out I actually understood English enough to, to make a point. Um, and, and at that same time, I was trying to sort out what it is I call home because uh, Bosnia um, wasn't home anymore, but it is what it, it is who I am. And I, I don't want to shy away from that. That is, um, everything that I am comes from that place. So when Teddy was writing about Ghana being beautiful, yet none of us know how to appreciate it unless we take a step back. I was thinking that is Bosnia to me every time. Oh, um, no. and so but, but in America, I, this wasn't home either. Um, and, you know, people would tell me once you have your family fear, it will feel home and, and it's getting there. There was a point in my life in my late twenties when I really needed a place, you know, to say, I am from such and such place. But when people ask me, where are you from? Gosh, I hated that question because then I had to explain. I was born in this country that doesn't exist anymore. I carry a passport of these other two. No, I'm not an American citizen. It's hard for me to give up my passport to another country, but my life is here. I don't live there, but I don't live here either. And mm -hmm. over time, I became more comfortable with a sense of home being the place to create with the community and people that are around you. Yeah. And the place is mobile. It's portable. Um, so that has that has changed what I write about and how I write about it. Because I think in my last yeah. 20s, my writing was quite angry. Um, yeah. And now it's there about, you know, I, I wanna write about things that inspire me and that is the community around me. And, and it's not always pretty. And we certainly lived through a really bad year last year, not just medically, just by the community surrounding us. Mm -hmm. um, that is quite yeah. unjust. 
Um, so that's a long question, a really long run on sentence, but I, I think it gets to the point. It surely does, Anna. Thanks for that. Could you age? Yeah. I know what inspires you, but I'm going to ask you anyway. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> well, look, I, I just write. I've been writing for a long time. Um, I write when I'm happy, when I'm sad, I'm excited, I'm bored. I just write. It's either on my phone tapping away with two thumbs or with a laptop or iPad typing away. Um, I like to believe that I'm, I'm gifted with incredible typing speed. And so I type. And often, I think about 90 something percent of my writings are just in somewhere. But I have this ability to remember where it is. So if something comes up again, my mind draws the links and I pull it out and there's a message out. So that's how I started writing. And then I, 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 along the line, I found out that I could actually rhyme. And so I doubled a bit in, po in poetry and tried to do rhyming schemes of A, B, A, B, 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 A, do the sonnets with the volta and the turn and everything. I went back to my old A-level literature and relearned mm -hmm. poetry and, and, and the, the various parts of the poem, et cetera, et cetera. And so I just write. So I, you might know that I text a lot. I post a lot. I prefer a text message or a phone call, obviously. Um, but basically, I think it's the biggest expression of, of who I am, you know, is that I write and I write a lot and I read a lot. So that's just it. Anything that happens, I just grab the, ne the nearest thing that I can write with and I just write. Often I, I do come across as being impatient with my country and being angry with my country because I believe that I have not seen a country with as much potential achieve so little. You know, and I say that if a kid goes of mine goes to school, not that I beat my kids, but if a kid goes to school and comes back and the, the terminal report, the report for the term is there's more room for improvement. We are going to have a discussion because why is there room for improvement? Why have you not occupied the room? And I think that, that is, that's been Ghana's story for 60 years. There's more room for improvement. But you know what worries me most about Ghana? The room for improvement gets just gets bigger. That is my problem with Ghana. There's more room for improvement, but the more keeps getting bigger because we are not occupying that room. We are shrinking with what we have and just leaving a lot of room for improvement. So these are the things that get me writing and these are the things that get me angry and then I write. Yeah, that's about it. Thank you so much. Um, I, th I see some hands up. Um, let me see. Uh, Nana Redamwa, do you have a question? Go ahead and unmute yourself and go for it. Yes, Doc, I have a question. Uh, good sure. afternoon, everyone. Um, good afternoon. It's exciting to be here. So I have um, two, two questions. One is to Ace. Um, the, the reading from uh, about Baba and how it came to, no, the reading about the, the, the meetings and uh, how it came to pass, does he get into that situation where something happens and he's, he tells himself that, ooh, you know, I had this idea to write this about some years ago, but I didn't. And that's he beat himself for it. And then when his writings get, if you if you like, uh, the prophetic, and I'm using prophetic in quotes, uh, gets to pass, does he get exasperated that what he has written about in the past gets repeating uh, itself and it doesn't really uh, uh, encourage him to write because it's like the same issues uh, happening again. And to all the writers, I wanted you to share with us your writing uh, process because I see a lot of young writers uh, listening and we, we all, even the old ones, can learn uh, something from the process. Thanks. And then uh, to, your, to your last part, I think we'll do that after the second round, but I'll let you answer his questions. Sure. Well, um, thanks, thanks enough for that. Um, the, 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 it's, 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 I go through what I, I might call an, an epiphany from time to time. When something I've written about comes to pass or something I've thought about writing about comes to pass. But you know, I'm basically at this stage where I live life like this with my arms folded because it, it sounds like you just keep repeating the same thing. You keep saying it over and over again. You keep trying to do what you can do about it, but things just don't change. So there's a part of me that says, oh, I should have written about that. But there's another part that said, what would have changed if I'd written about that? Because what has changed about the things that I've written about? So I don't get, I don't have a sort of, a sort of gotcha, you know, thing. Ah, there, I told you so, sort of thing. But it is indeed frustrating that 
the things you say or sometimes say and warn about actually do come to pass and you see that there's precious little that's been done about it. But let me say that there are other things that you speak, that one speaks about, which actually happened and you are happy that, you know, it was addressed and the next time it came up, um, the situation was dealt with. One of the things you should, you should never expect as a writer is to be giving credit for what you say. Um, when it comes up, somebody else is going to take the credit for it, but be happy with the fact that you have helped the process, right? No, very few people are going to remember what you've written. Some might, most might not. But yeah, I do get that epiphany when I know that, ah, I talked about, I spoke about this and I'll go find out that this is what I wrote. When I was writing about meetings, of course I had no clue what this was about. So it's just a part of me which says that physical meetings are unnecessary. In fact, things run better if we just have the meeting as we've had this meeting. I don't have to travel to Kentucky where there's no fried chicken, but just bourbon to have this meeting with, with, with Nana Gansa. We could, we could, have, we could hey. have this meeting. Yeah, oh, sorry. Is, 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 is it not bourbon you guys produce? Or is Jack Daniels? I know I'm, I know I'm causing trouble. <laughs> I know I'm causing anyway, trouble. Yeah. so Evans, Evans Albert, I mute yourself and ask your question. All right, thank you. My question goes to you. Um, what inspired your very first reading? Thank you. Um, that, that's to me, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so, um, uh, to, to kind of keep it short, um, there's been a spate of uh, police interactions with black, black men that haven't gone too well. And uh, there are some that don't even involve weapons um, at all. And uh, there seems to be this culture of uh, shoot first and ask later. And uh, for everybody with a son who is Black living in the U.S. here, you how about that fear that this son of yours is going to go out there and not come back one day? It's, it's a real life possibility. And it doesn't matter whether you live in a, a subdivision with a million dollar home or so you live in the hood. Um, the, the determinant factor really seems to be uh, the color of the skin. And that, that is what inspired me to write that. Okay. All right. And I think uh, we have another question from, uh, it was a Sanosis. Yeah, uh, good afternoon from the UK. Yeah. Good afternoon from the good UK. Afternoon. Yeah, just uh, thank you for setting this up with your friends. I think this is very uh, good start that you are doing, and I hope there's more that you're going to do in the future. My question is that for the general, whoever picks you up, is that are you going to include the younger generation? Because writing and reading is very fundamental in human beings' growth, as you found out for yourselves. Uh, is there any chance of this being replicated among the next generation? Because we see that they come oh, from a different generation where they don't pick books or something. But I had my senior talk about how he plays on his laptop and is then doing reading and writing. But we find out that uh, youngsters these days do not have that discipline. They would rather play games or something else. So the next time we we'll see something like this with your friends is that playing games or playing some arcade game instead of reading and writing. So is there any uh, room whereby you can raise this to make this very interesting for the youth that are coming up? Uh, we'll, we'll, we can only try. We, we can only try. I have, I have uh, connections to, to the right Ghana writing community. I'm trying to establish connections there. So yes, we'll try and uh, reach out to the, that, like you can see, um, Joe Nketiah is a representation of this youth. You know? So uh, we'll, we'll make that effort to, to bring them together. And I hope to be able to do another session of this maybe in a month or so. So we'll, we'll keep at that. Thank you for the question. Uh, we'll take the last round from Kuklu and then we'll start the second round. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Okay, thank you. Nana Gaza, this goes to you. Um, in your first writer, the first poet, how is it that it's always the men, the boys, I've had, you know, shoot before you ask questions. What about the women? What about the girls? Or oh, they are not in danger or they suffer a different kind of danger? Uh, that, that, that is a, a very loaded question and it should take a long time to, to delve into that. But they are, because the reporting on these incidents are very porous. 
Um, and we really don't have all the numbers, but you, if you don't know, remember the story of Sandra Blonde down in Texas, it does happen to the women also. It really does, but it just seems to happen more with the men. Um, there seems to be a higher confrontation with the men and, and that's why. Okay, all right. Um, thanks for the questions. Let's, let's get on with, with the second round here. Um, and uh, we'll go back to Joe. All right, thank you. So um, I also have two short uh, poems, so I just quickly read them. And the first one is The Day You Wake Up. Um, the, what inspired this poem was, there was a day I woke up get, getting ready to go to work. I, by 5.30, I've left the house. And when I woke up, I was so tired that, I mean, going to work, I felt like, no, I wish today I would have to go to work. And that inspired the poem. So the day you wake up strong. The day you wake up strong, you will not set yourself out of bed with bored legs and feet. It will be in your own body and all the members of your body. Because the night before you have drawn yourself with tears and almost died of exhaustion. And you slept away with many visiting voices in your head and you hope to find yourself not awoken. But the sun, my darling, is a promise of hope for all humanity. And you are part of the universe that wants you. And the very place you have cried will be remembered with smiles. And the very places you have been plagued will become a monument of worship where others will come and kiss. So the day you wake up strong, it will not be in someone else's body. It will be in your own body. Because darling, when you stop waiting for a savior, your body becomes strong to carry its own cross. Thank you. Yeah. And the second one is um, God is a poet. So I, I was just thinking of, I'm a Christian. So I just wrote this from a point of my spirituality and my belief. So it says God is a poet. God is a poet. Because in the beginning, he created the universe. Not from any design or plan, no specifications or calculations, no time planning or documentations, no elements detailed, no concrete steps or footings if applicable, no measurements or annotations, no perceived shape and form whether earth needed to be perfectly flat or round, no laws were made and yet the universe was made when he said his first three verses of poetry, let the be. And out from this simple verses, starting from extreme high density and temperatures, space expanded, the universe cooled, and the simple elements formed. Gravity gradually drawing matter together to form stars and galaxies. God is the big bang theory your science teacher forgot to tell you about. Out of God's mark came poetry, simple, minute, with but yet a violent burst of becomings. The entire universe was made when the greatest poet, God said his verses, let the be. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Joe. Um, Pleasure. We'll move on to, move on to um, Anna. Hey, um, this is, um, I don't know what this is. So maybe a reflection, it's not a poem. It's called Something Better. Um, and it really is a compilation of multiple thoughts I've had over the last several years since technology has made us meet each other easily. We can talk to each other, we can talk to complete strangers um, without really knowing their story. And so we, we tend to fight over things, over little echoes of phrases without really having a conversation. So, and then 2020 happened and uh, it exploded this sense of misunderstanding everywhere globally, but particularly in America. So um, this is called something better. Wars no longer end like they used to, at least not in the way we learned from the history books of our childhood censored as they were. There are no big celebrations on the street of modern metropolis, no random strangers sharing a kiss in a nostalgic sepia background, no hail the conquering hero parades or the Hollywood style conclusions in which we all dance in an oblivion of a tragedy we barely survived these days. Wars end quietly, if they end at all. The end seeps in slowly, almost imperceptibly at first, until one day we find ourselves no longer standing in the waterline and no longer hearing the gunfire. 
the battlefield stays behind. Buzzing in the background, however, the trauma remains, defining how we adapt to a new normal, often by fearing each other. This is, I suppose, how pandemics end too. But let's meander to a different time for a moment and let me tell you about my mom. She believes that if I go out right after a shower, I will succumb to a mystery illness and well, I'll die. All my people know someone, doctors too, who developed head inflammation after allowing the wind into their wet hair. Do you mean encephalitis, I ask, finally feeling some reprieve from the summer sun? That is not how you get sick. You are not some child from a village, she says, who never knew better. Look at all you've done. You should not stand here in a draft towing with your life. Feel free to laugh, I laugh too. Draft is the most dreaded killer in the Balkans by which of course I refer to the wind and not the military kind. Though I do know too many names lost to that latter one. I do know better, I say, pathogens is how we get ill and some are in fact good for us, but I've yet to find a pathologist who speaks of the killer draft. And she shakes her head, handing me some slippers and says, don't play with your life, child. I'm not playing, mama, I'm just burning up. But the next day I get a fever and a cough. Those were pre-COVID times and cancel all my plans. And my mother, well, she wipes me down with vinegar and wraps my feet in onion to bring the fever down. And what do you know, I get better. She doesn't dwell on it at all, doesn't patronize. You'll never hear that I told you so, only gratitude that you are indeed still alive. Soon she sends me into the world again with tears in her eyes as she does each time I leave for America. My mother is a retired, accomplished nurse who also believes the following. Sitting directly on the concrete will freeze your ovaries, rendering you infertile. Riding in a car with open windows will give you strep throat, leading to rheumatic heart disease and an untimely death, of course. Sitting in the breeze, particularly in that sweet, sweet cross breeze causes pyelonephritis. And don't you remember way back when you were a child having all those draft induced mm. GIs? Bare feet are the root of all illness and you must wear slippers even in the summertime. Yeah, that is my mom. But she's known from the get-go that COVID was real and masked herself from day one, even when others said, but what will people say? And she'd answer, who cares? At least we'll be around to enjoy the fight. Mm -hmm. These days, I lose much sleep over other people's children, even those who mothers believe COVID to be a hoax, blaming me for obstructing their rights. Freedom is not free of responsibility, I'd like to scream. Please pull up your mask and let's talk about the social contract. But we have no time. There's blood on the floor and we're already behind. Each child bleeds the same and their mothers worry just as much as mine. Our bond immediate, welded in doubt and thankfully the clotting blood. Hemostasis weaves these ties that bind and we finally have a blank page in front of us. We are ready to listen and genuinely understand each other. Now, how do we replicate this compromise, free of bloodshed on a large scale? How do we mass produce a bond made in the trenches of compassion, especially when the other believes they're better than us, spitting vitriol toward us on this newest of front lines? It's easy when we start with the visual saving of a life, but what is saving is more subtle. And what if despite all we've got, we still have to face a massive loss of life? This is our moment of reckoning, isn't it? We could remain inside hidden from the virus and each other, which may protect our bodies, but the mind will succumb to an ongoing trauma. And if we let it linger, buzzing in the background, we will continue to fear each other. This is our moment of reckoning, a scaffolding to repair a moral injury, a chance for something better. I suggest we step outside and begin by talking about our mothers, those who gave birth to us and those who stepped in in the meantime the two young to be moms and the long established matriarchs, all the moms whose babies did not come home, all the women desperately trying to be moms, all the women standing guard over mothers whose babies are not coming home, the refugee moms whose child is cared for by another woman and the other women caring from the strangest child whose language they do not speak. The mothers who stay home to work and never feel good enough and those who go to work and feel a failure for they are neither. Let us talk about the village of women walking through our lives who have loved us in all the languages of motherhood and continue to show us grace and strength abundant 
theirs is the way forward. This pandemic will end slowly, probably imperceptibly at first, but the end will come. And many of us will pick up and function as if nothing has changed at all, but we are different and we will be traumatized, we already are. And in my experience, the only way to genuinely cope with this is to turn it into something better. So let me conclude with my mother. She thinks you will die from pneumonia if you take ice in your water and she'll use Google Translate to convince you that she's right. She loves the smell of lilacs in the spring and so do I. Tell me, who is it you fear for the most the way a mother does? Here. Take my hand, let's climb out of that pit of fear together. Let us bear witness before we judge. Let that be our purpose. To see ourselves in others when all the anger is done, maybe, just maybe this is how we turn it into something better. Thank you. Mm. Beautiful. Great. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, so let's move on, Aben Ace, it's your turn. Hey Ben, do you hear me? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Great. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Yeah. So I'll try to squeeze two short poems in one. And the first piece was inspired by Chadwick Bosman's Demise, um, the Black Panther fame. Yeah. And I just reflected on his young life and everything that he actually stood for. And I wrote this. So while we are here, make each fleeting moment count. Make it worth living. Leave pieces of your life in the hearts of men for time to remember when you are gone. Walk the path of good less traveled. While we are here, smell the roses and breathe in life. Heal from the pricks of thorns and lay in the greens of peaceful breezes. Wear your smile like a medal on your heart and allow your face to show it to the world. Be happy living and honestly grateful for life and opportunities. While we are here, hold no grudge in your heart, plant no seed of hatred in your mind and allow yourself to be at peace. Stretch your hands and feel the grip of friendship. Open your arms to house warm hearts of love for your heart to believe in humanity again. While we are here, dare to make a dream come through while the restless time tickles. Leave no room for procrastination when, when tomorrow is a mirage. Laugh your heart out and try not to be burdened by the worries of tomorrow. Hold on to hope and work your fate with purpose in mind. While we are here, try and be good. Try and be at peace. Try and hold no worries of tomorrow. Hold on to peace and work your fate with promise, with purpose in mind. While we are here, be the sunshine to other lives and allow their sunshine in your gloom when you go dim. Be, be the safe haven for distressed lives. Feed your soul the nutrients of life, open its gate to free toxic when it bears. Allow the serenity of humanity to take its place before sunrise. While we are here, make here while the sun shines today before the darkness creeps in tomorrow. Seek the Lord to direct your path while numbering your days. Make memories and enjoy the moments while they last. Take care of your mind, spirit, and body with all you can. Leave your footprints before the last rain. While we are here, live, breathe. So the next one is actually on um, sexual abuse. I, it, was, it was one of the sexual abuse um, rape stories that happened. And then it, it got me right in this one. I think it was Nigeria. So, yeah. It's called Do Not. When the, temp when the doors of my temple are shut, do not break in. Do not seek its locks to open or force its hangers to loosen. When I deny you worship in here, do not break a cord. Do not raise a muzzle to mute me when my innocence speaks. When I say stop, I don't mean start. Do not progress any further. Do not take my soulful solemn no as yes clothed in a refusal. When you pin my back to the floor, do not think I want it. Do not assume my inability to fight means you should proceed. When tears run down my heavy eyes, do not see ecstasy in here. Do not see sweetness in sore cries while you dent my blissful soul. When my arms grow feeble to oppose, 
Do not think you, you have won. Do not think you have satisfied yourself while you starve me joy. Monsters like you don't belong here in the place of sanity. In the place my sovereign freedom resides, do not plug my wings. It is no more worship when the doors of my temple are pushed down. It is thievery. It is you taking a bite of my flowery life which you are not permitted in this garden. Do not. Wow. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Um, well, we will move on. Uh, let's go to Teddy. So I'll, I'll read an essay. It's a bit longish, um, but I, I think it has uh, points that are cogent to today. Um, I wrote this um, in 2015, and as I was just browsing through it, it was just surprising um, how, you know, time really stands still and, and, and we should, and, and, you know, the power of writing things, because then we, we can go back and realize that it, 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 it encapsulates an experience that hasn't really changed. So I call this a doctor sticker. My car does not have a doctor sticker. At first it was because I just could not make the time to deal with the hassle of sending my documents to the GMA house and all that came with it. That is a long sentence to explain laziness. I'm still lazy now, but it has tended to take a philosophic dimension. I'm a doctor who has slowly become more skillful at explaining my incapacity than dimension it. I work in an environment where I've become more skilled at improvising and adapting than innovating and improving. Sometimes I'm not sure about the label I bear. And so sometimes my laziness is more a reflection of a certain schizophrenia that I have to live with. In the fast developing world where we are, what we do, it is difficult to retain relevance when I can only claim to be and explain my inability to do. Sometimes the lack of a sticker on my car reflects a part of that irrelevance. And I keep hoping for the time when my car wears that sticker with pride, the day when my laziness loses any philosophic justification. I can't project this schizophrenia onto anyone. However, Living in a Ghana of today, it is difficult not to sense the irony. After all, we are an oil producing country with an energy crisis. We are an <laughs> agricultural country with hungry citizens. We're a gold producing country without a gold refinery. We are an independent country with an incapacity to make decisions that improve the lot of our country. We have called our star black because we had a certain radiance that displaced the darkness that the color bestowed. Now, however, in our hamatan of discontent, I wonder if that color reflects a certain loss of light. There's a certain bleakness on looking down from a plane as it settles into the landing trajectory for Kotoka. It is the bleakness of Dumso. It is a bleakness that is turning people away from this land of blessing. It is only the schizophrenia that can explain why in a sovereign country with a functioning health system, malaria still kills as many people as it does. And why in a country that has never experienced civil war, cholera still has the guerrilla capacity to launch out of the shadows, kill people and disappear, untraceable, unpreventable until the next time. Even non-torrential rain can kill in this country. Simple events assume cataclysmic implications because of non-action, non-planning, zero strategy. Like a simple fire, wiping out almost all the medical supplies we have as a country, or a single shut pipeline shrouding large suites of the country in darkness. And as I drive through manhole, man-made potholes to my home every day in this gateway to Africa, 
it is this irony staring me in the face. And it has a pull to it. There's a certain ghanian about this irony that seeks to envelop me. We're all trying to survive in this dysfunctional double beingness. We're investing the pickings of our poverty, building self-sufficient castles when we can afford them. So we have septic tanks, one pair home instead of sewage systems. We have single home water supply systems instead of functioning community-based water processing systems. We have generators and inverters and solar panels because the hitherto reliable community power system can lose its function anytime. In a world where collaboration, advocacy, networking are the founding pillars of all progress, we are becoming more individualized every day. So in this world, we are daily incapacitating ourselves. Every opportunity we lose to merge our capacities together is an opportunity given to failure, despondence, and ultimate retrogression. I worry about my country. I worry that this blessed nation still goes cup in hand begging for money and that we have to raise our bits just to give money, just to be given some money which ends up dissipating. There are people doing fantastic work in this country, but it is still a failing country. And it is that split personality that baffles me sometimes. Some months ago, some colleagues of mine were up in arms over an outdated international assessment of our healthcare system. Most did not notice how outdated the update was. There was a major uproar detailing how insulting we felt by the hard hitting writer. It is insulting to hardworking doctors in this country that cholera is endemic, but it's true. It is insulting to all the hardworking medical personnel that malaria kills so many children every hour, but it is true. I see in our response to these crises, a country devolving itself of responsibility to solve problems. I have seen the, the horror on our roads because of the lack of a unified strategy to reduce accidents. I have seen young colleague doctors leave the country in droves because of a lack of a unified strategy to employ them and keep them. 150 doctors have just finished medical school and gone home. They will stay at home unemployed for the next six months, just like their predecessors before them. And then they will start working and they will not be paid until they go on strike and disaster will strike. And newspapers will come out on the stands, roaring a national sense of effrontery and life will go on until ne the next set of doctors. I live here, I still look at for and find things to be thankful for. Sometimes I wish my ghanian was like the car sticker. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, Ace, your turn now. Yes, thanks. Oh, Doctor, um, Teddy and everyone, that's been awesome. Um, of bees, bees and flies. <laughs> he used to send me encouraging text messages whenever I made digs at the then government. He disliked that government with a passion. I wrote this piece in 2015. He disliked that government with a passion. The last time I met him fiscally, there had been a change of government. His party was now in power. I was now making digs at his preferred government. He was giddy with excitement, yet literally foaming at the mouth. And with his fingers almost in my face, he asked me to back off nitpicking at his government. Go to court if you think you're a lawyer, he said between bouts of stuffing his face and newly rounded cheeks with roast turkey. He soon got some appointment, some new Toyota and things. Then somehow, through the ebbs and flows of life, the turn and tides of time and nature, his side of the gravy train totted, derailed, stumbled, and tumbled. His party was in power, but his star faded. And with it came 
the running out of the gravy. He became bitter, jaded, and oblivion bound. That's why I was taken aback when he sent a text saying, good job, bro, keep it up. Huh? Who? Me? I asked whether the text was meant for me, and he said, yes. I have always supported your anti-establishment stance. Keep up the fight against corruption. We are all members of Occupy Ghana. A ruddy Jesus. Okay, this is where I was British. I am gobsmacked. I am convinced that I attract bees and flies. Wow. Okay. The last, <laughs> last one. The last one. And then I'll, <laughs> and then I'll leave. Um, Christmas Day 2014. My Christmas morning. And so I wake up at the crack of dawn to do some urgent client work, only to see the message, dear valued customer, you have exhausted your bundle. Huh? No Wi-Fi? I'm ready to kill each of the three visiting visitors, home on vacation, and who have been using my Wi-Fi to stream movies or whatever nonsense teenagers are up to on the net these days. Where do I top up on a day like this, Christmas Day? I call and wake up my poor I, I and then wake my poor IT officer up. We try internet top up, no luck. I'm ready to kill. The main offender is quickly identified and hauled before me to become the victim of my righteous anger to be drawn and quartered. She appears very sorry. She appears with sorry written all over her and meekly offers me her phone to use her airtime, which was like one CD. But my heart melts. At least she offered me something. Then I remembered <laughs> it is Christmas after all, a day to remember where, when God gave his best for a beast like me. She used up my bundle and offered me hairs. Inadequate, but a sweet exchange. Or that client won't die if the work goes tomorrow. Merry Christmas, family. Merry Christmas. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, so I guess it's my turn now. I'm also pro going to try and squeeze up uh, two pieces in one. Um, this, this, these two pieces deal with finality. Um, my, my work is influenced a lot about with, by the issue of finality. The first one is called the ride. He'll ride his bike to the city. Maybe he'll see the dandelions in bloom, growing all wild but still pretty along the roadside needing a groom. He'll ride his bike to the city, over that bridge all rickety and worn. That always elicited no pity, getting nothing but curses and scorn. Yeah, to the city he'll ride, past the little sweet bake shop, which smells that road like a tide, buffeting one's senses without a stop. He'll ride the city on his bike, past fields dotted with horses and trees, with views he never could dislike. Then they could set a heart completely at ease. Yet he he needs to find the courage to ride back again to it all. Worry of the memories that rage that could break down his wall. From the park where it all started to the diner where he had the rent. At the station where they once parted and a reunion that made her sing. Long walks they took by the river as they listened to musicians play. Moonlight kisses that made her shiver. They live for each and every day. So how can he make his way alone? to mementos so dear and profound. So let me pin myself, sorry. How can he ride into that zone with hair not, with hair not here and around to see the dandelions in bloom over the rickety bridge in decay by the bakery where it smells bloom past fields where horses neigh. He ride into the city again when that en what envelops his soul is not the loss and the raw pain, but memories that make him whole. He ride into the city again, bought by a lesson he had to unpack. She gave him a gift some never attained of loving and being loved back. And uh, so I have, I'm gonna squeeze this one in. It's titled, When He Showed Up. I told him I was not ready when he showed up that day. Incredulously incredulous, he stared me down. Unperturbingly unperturbed, I stared right back into cold nothingness. I told him I still had things to do when he said it was the day. Surprisingly surprised, he cast his biting gaze on me. Smilingly smiling, I sought to break the ice and met humorlessness. 
I told him I needed more time when he said the clock had run out. Emotionally, emotionless, he pointed at the hourglass. Unflinchingly, unflinching, I turned it upside down, but it was suddenly empty of sand. I demand more time, then there's still so much to do. I insist on more days, there's someone to love. I require another year, there are fences to mend. I'm due a lunar cycle, I need to reach out to her. Yet his cold dark eyes seemed unaware of my wishes. No smile flooded across his face. No measure of understanding. I sought to reach a heart, touch a cord of understanding, yet steadfastly waited, untouched, and moved and faced. You see, with him, it's no bargaining. When he shows up to collect, with him, it's no dealing. When he appears unannounced, he say, can say his hands are ready to touch and end it all. No entreaties pierce his chest where a heart should be. So I close my eyes and thought of what was, what could have been and might have been. Thus, as the sun sunk beneath the skies and the moon faded into the clouds, me and him with his cold eyes set off on a journey for which I was not ready, for which I needed more time, for which I left things undone. Though I realized it was all over, still I told him I was not ready. Incredulously, incredulous, surprisingly surprised, emotionlessly emotionless, he stared me down with his eyes that was full of nothingness. Thank you. Mm. Wow. So that's the end of the second round. Um, what time is it? Can we squeeze in another round before we go to the question? Do you guys have more material? <laughs> yeah, uh, good. Yeah, we can always do essay. something. I have, an essay. I have an essay I could read and then um, if I could go ahead with that, yeah, so and then if should, anybody uh, has, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll go ahead and just read my essay real quick and then we, we can do questions. So this is titled An Art Form. My cousin Kofi in Detroit had been trying to reach me for days. Our schedules did not allow me to call at a reasonable time. I had not been able to keep several promises to call him either. Since I knew he was an early bird, I decided to call him on my drive in one Friday morning a few weeks ago. Know that I set off for work around 6.15 a.m. when most people are still sleeping. Mm -hmm. I called up Siri. She responded. I stated my cousin's name and asked her to call him. She replies, call him Kofi D. Well, I had forgotten that the number I had saved for Kofi was an old one. I would be reminded of that shortly. The voice that came over the speaker was not Kofi's voice. It was not even that of a man. From the sound of the first sentence, I knew I had just woken up a woman not called Kofi. And she sounded pissed off. Hello, Kofi Nanazi. Who the bleep is this? Do you know what the bleeping time is? Ma'am, I'm trying to reach my cousin Kofi. Your bleeping Kofi cousin in here. Do you know what time it is? Sorry, ma'am, but I think I may have the wrong number. The bleep you have. I apologize. Why the bleep would you wake up somebody's bleeping early on a bleeping Friday morning? What the bleeping is wrong with you? Can't you bleeping read? Now you have bleeping messed up my bleeping sleep. You bleeper. Then she hung up. <laughs> the minute she hung up, I just unleashed the laughter that I'd been holding back as she cursed me all the morning. I was not offended at all. I had interfered with her sleep and she deserved to curse me out. Mm -hmm. What made me laugh was the language. It was how effortlessly she strung the curse words together, the tone and the cadence of her voice that conveyed her pissed offness and how the expletive Latin outburst had a meter like a poem. I was fascinated. It was a skill I just had to admire and add for me then. As I drove along, it struck me that most swear words have four letters and are monosyllabic. I wondered if that was just happenstance or a plot by the curse gods to make them easier to reel out. Later that weekend, I did the obligatory search for what, why most curse words have four letters and are monosyllabic. The reasons were as varied and the theories profound. From the fact that most of these words were of the more pluritarian Germanic origin and not the noble French stock, to the fact that the way words used by commoners to express frustration, to the thought that they reflected basic human process and actions, one thing stayed the same. They were easy to reel out and unmistakable in their messaging. They conveyed the message that the speaker was pissed off. And why not? There's a whole vocabulary for love, poems, Love songs, plays. There are myriad ways to exhort and encourage. Thousands to describe bravery, victory, and success. We even have 
dictionaries to describe war and death. So why not a few for those times when we lose it, for those moments when we descend into the basement where anger and fury reign, where we allow our better self to take a back seat and unleash our animalistic tendencies mm-hmm. in four letter monosyllabic burst of indignation. I maintain that those times deserve their own language too, and its words must be easy to use and master. It must be a language where the words can be thrown together with normal ones to get the message across. We all grew up being taught that the wisdom of not losing our temper and always to keep our composure. We are encouraged not to use foul language and be decent. And yet we all end up with a stash of these curse words in our vocabulary that may escape unannounced now and then. After mm-hmm. all, we are all human and we live in a world that is imperfect, exhausting, and sometimes downright frustrating. We live in a world where a random guy wakes you up at 6 20 a.m. looking for his cousin who had not had that number for years. We drive on roads where someone can cut you off or jump a red light. Even times where customers and colleagues push you past your limits. Yeah. Times like those, we sometimes forget what our mothers taught us never to do. And then we let them wreck. In those times, wisdom and reason flee and momentarily even forget the consequences of an unexpected laden outburst. We throw caution to the wind and let them stream. Those, those mainly fall at the words. Cares if you must, but do me a favor as you go all expletive. Like that woman on the phone that morning, let it flow with a tone, a cadence, and meter that match your piss offness. Then and only then do you elevate the process to the art form that it is, the art mm-hmm. of cursing out. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah. So, anybody else has anything to just throw in? We have actually some time. Well, I, I, I could... have a short poem. Okay. Okay, okay go ahead. Please go in. Please yeah, go in. Always, me. always, always yeah. ladies first. Ladies first. Oh. <laughs> always ladies first. I, okay, I don't care so, what they um... say. <laughs> All right, so this is a, a short poem that um, it's more like my signature poem. A- anywhere I go, I want to recite it. Um, the inspiration, I had clothes from work one day and it was a late night shift and I was just talking to myself and then I just looked up and I saw this, the star and I just told myself I'm a star. So when I went home, I just researched what stars were and that birthed this poem. So it goes like this. Don't dim the light you carry in your face just because someone needs to squint in order to see the light in your glowing eyes. You are not like, you are not close to, you don't resemble, but you are. You are a star and you shine because you know your truth that you are a combination of many incredible things happening at the same time. You are, yes, a unique being made of your strength and your weaknesses. You are a holy, deadly explosion of such an amazing energy. So when morning comes, baby, look up. That is you shining. And when the night comes, darling, just raise your head up because that is you shining. You are not like... You are not close to, and you don't resemble, but you are, you are a star. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I love that. All right, who goes next? Should I? I, 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 was, I? Trying one, I was trying to get one in. Does it work? All right. Okay, go me? ahead. Eh? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I sometimes put my, my camera up because my connection is a bit dodgy. So, uh, yeah. Okay, let me just read this. It is the pleasure of self-inflicted poverty. The pleasure of self-inflicted poverty. I'll read it very quickly so this is a slight language. Sleep is for the weak. Now I say sleep is for those who can afford it. May I do a long, painful, and insulting poverty rant? Please sit yourself sure because I, I will neither pull punches nor take any prisoners. As I wind up another visit to another foreign country, Sweden this time, as I meet and share ideas with colleague heads of litigation departments in law firms from several other countries, and I was only African and Black among 37 people, I admit once again, and must reiterate, that when poverty sends you, it is real. Oh, here, smile. When poverty sends you, it is real. Today, I believe more in the word of the Lord uttered through the doing sort of, well, of wisdom, Solomon, the ancient and third king of Israel, that I went past the field of the sluggard, past the vineyard of someone who has no sense. 
storms had come up everywhere. The ground was covered with weeds and the stone wall was in, was in ruins. I applied my heart to what I observed and learned a lesson from what I saw. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest and poverty will come on you like a thief and scarcity like an armed man. Sleep is for the weak or for those who can afford it. I make no apologies when I say that I live in the land that I live in the land that is the field of the sluggard and vineyard of the senseless. We are blessed with fields and vineyards but they are filled with thorns. Why? We can't simply remove the thorns. We are blessed with good ground, but it has weeds everywhere. Why? Have we forgotten how to weed? We have built a stone wall in times past, or maybe somebody built it for us, or maybe we inherited it, but today it's in ruins. Why? Because we have no maintenance culture. Our gold industry is in ruins. Show me a place in Ghana that is evidence of 100 years of gold mining. Our cocoa in, is covered with weeds because it is still rain-fed and a hoe and cutlass industry. Even the newly found oil and gas industry is covered with thorns. We are competing with the Dutch for a severe version of the Dutch disease. We make precious little or next to nothing from our natural resources. Countries with nothing close to what God has blessed us with make much more and far more than we do. Sweden is one such country. Why? We are fast asleep, loudly snoring, heavily drooling, lazily slumbering. Our hands are perpetually in a folded position. We repeatedly fail to apply our hearts to simple wisdom. A once man once said in Fanti, to it, how can you complain of tiredness when that which pursues you is still in hot pursuit? Sleep is for the weak or for those who can afford it. Poverty and ruin pursue, pursue us all. If a man or woman who knows it takes a man or woman who knows there's nothing to fall back on but the hard ground to keep fighting. How I wish that this would be the truth of every Ghanaian and that everyone would rise up, eschew all laziness and loafing around and even traces of them and work like our very lives depend on work. Actually, our lives depend on work. And so the Almighty himself has promised to bless the work of our hands. So if his blessings are a multiplier and he comes to bless or multiply the work of our hands and the sum of all our work is zero or negative, his blessing will yield no profit. That defines Ghana, our miraculous ability to be poor in the midst of plenty, the mystery of pulling penury and dry straw out of riches, and the prodigious, pro, pro, prodigious feat of being able to, of being and remaining hungry in the abundance of food. When poverty sends you and you still sit where you are sitting, we are on an iron from poverty, but we are sitting at the same place where we have always been. Even poverty has gotten tired of us, has overtaken us, and is busy chasing other people. I hope I've offended you. Good night. <laughs> All right. I like the part about poverty. Um, there, there's a, there's a, a, a saying by Chinua Achebe where he says, when poverty knocks at the door and you tell him you don't have a chair for him, he tells you he brought his own. Um, oh. yeah, it mm. just reminds me of that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Teddy, you have something to read? Yes, I have a short story. Um, so it, it's a story called The Rage. Um, let me just go straight to it. When the man stepped into the car, I knew there was something wrong. It was not his dressing. He looked decent, but there was something wrong. I just could not put my finger on what it was. I looked out the window as the colorful scenery whisked by, seeing what everybody in a speeding Accra car sees. A market woman here, oranges there, delectable salmonella ridden sugarcane chunks, all neatly wrapped up and packaged, a roadside industry. The manufacturers standing guard by their products, fabricating new packages right before my eyes. I leaned back into my seat, wondering how and when I was going to tell daddy the bad news. The driver took a sharp turn and my stomach did a little flip as he leveled out, nonchalantly, oblivious to whatever discomfort his driving exploits were causing his poor passengers. Then the man sitting next to me spoke, just a phrase, and it filled the car. The pungency was fierce. I could touch stench. The entire cabin became suffused with one gallon of strong apetite. Drivers of today, I realized my stomach muscles had knotted seriously. Suddenly, I found myself hoping frantically that at least 
for the rest of the journey, he would keep his mouth shut. Um, could you roll the window down for me? Oh, 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 I held my breath and rolled down the windows dutifully, only after suffocating minutes of finding out what connection the metal rod lying on the floor had with the glass window. After laboring to get some air into the car, I released my breath and gulped in what I thought was going to be fresh air. It was not. Now I really understood what mosquitoes go through when rain comes into the picture. The air alcohol mixture was not reducing in potency. But how you fit booze like that? That was from the back. I turned and looked full indignation in the face. The poor man's eyes were watering and popping as he stared furiously at Mr. Akweteshi Gallon. Who told you I was drunk? Oh dear me, and he spoke good English too. You think I'm like those drunkards who drink in the chop bar and can't walk home? By now, everybody was reaching for a handkerchief. My nose had started running. I breathed through my handkerchief and realized it was useless. Nobody dared question him on why he had gotten so drunk. Nobody could, re in could risk an increase in the potency of the gaseous alcohol. It was all I could do to keep my head in the air and not to thrust my nose out for some sweet air. Driver, next stop, eh? Oh, thank God. I felt like clapping for joy. He reached into his pocket and took some money out. We are too, he said. The driver gave him his change. Who could be the one walking with this distillery? I had to stop myself from looking behind. I knew there were three passengers behind me. Who could it be? I knew it was not definitely the short man in the middle with the red eyes. The car stopped, the driver having stomped on his brakes in his usual uncaring way. I had to get down so he could come out. He tottered unsteadily. I have seen quite a few beautiful women, but the one who got out, well, I do not know how to say this, but once in a while you see a beauty that makes you blind and yet not blind at the same time. She held the man's left arm, putting her right arm around his waist, and they stood there, a strange pair, waiting for our car to move. As the car left them, I looked back. They were walking slowly. The woman was almost carrying the man. A sigh seemed to thread its way right from the back of the seven-seater Peugeot estate to the front. I got down at the next stop. My father was on the veranda. His face lit up when he saw me walk in. Hey, I've been waiting for you. I gave him a half-hearted smile. How did the results go? I looked at, up at him and shook my head. Daddy, I failed the exam. He was shocked for an instant. Then he hugged me, let go, held me in his arms and looked me in his eye and looked in my eyes with love. But son, you should not have gone drinking Akateshi just before, just because you failed this exam. I am surprised at you. I had him back. I did not know how to tell the story. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> wow. That's amazing. Right. The right. <laughs> should I come hey, in with a short yeah. story? Uh, yeah, as long as you can squeeze it in the time. Okay. How many minutes do I have? Uh, let's, let's say about five. Would that be okay? Let me see. Let me try. Let me do my best. Okay. Okay. So it's called My Mother Wept. I was 10. I was 10 when two friends and I were hunting for birds in the neighborhood on a sunny afternoon. We had in hand catapults, pebbles of stones in our pockets to strike birds down from trees. We threw stones at lizards as well as birds in distances to crown which one of us would tear the tail of a lizard on a wall. Roaming through the corners and angles of the neighborhood after hours, we couldn't shoot down a single bird. We pressed on hoping to find at least one bird to satisfy our quest for the day. 
Soon enough, Into spotted a brown looking bird tweeting on a weak branch of a tree. Shh! Bidu signaled me to keep mute so the bird wouldn't catch the plan when I praised its beauty. Well, the bird was pretty. It had silver linings stretching from the ends to ends of its lower beak. Its appealing yellowish beaks were pointed like the hands of the clock pointing at times. Spots of yellow feathers covered its body toward the neck. Right on the neck of this cute bed were petite, flappy white feathers that seemed to vibrate any time it turned its short neck around. The tiny legs looked, the tiny legs it stood on were skinny, yet firm as the trunk of the tree it stood on. Its eyes held calmness. It flapped its wings after flying up and back on the little branch and it was angelic. I couldn't help but admire the short seconds of bliss by altering and the felt, which means this bed is beautiful. Betty shut me up while we were behind a broken electric stove. In two position, the stone in the sling drew it back and made his arm alert any point in time to shoot down the bed. For some reasons best known to Into, he aborted the mission of shooting down the bed and asked me to do it. Really, I couldn't bury my surprise why a pro like Into would offer me, an amateur, this chance. I took it up with smile, set the stone right in the catapult, impatiently rose up and shot at the bed, with my little judgment on target. I missed the bed perfectly. It flew off leisurely, mocking at my pathetic self. In so when Bedou Rainey saw that me for missing the very chance which could have brought us joy, I apologized, but it fell on angry hearts which weren't ready to accept apologies. In our moment of contemplating on this missed chance, a woman and a lady approached our direction in haste, asking who threw the stone. Three confused musketeers, we panicked as they drew nine. One and two, Boba, you know, who threw the stones, they asked. The woman held the color of Pinto's Lacoste shirt and heckled him. Pinto quickly pointed at me in response to the woman's question. Holding the catapult and a couple of stones, I was guilty as charged. I remembered, fumbled and shook to inquire why the woman asked the question, but before I could utter, there. I was swept off in her huge hands to the house. <laughs> From the sides of my two friends to a house, my feet couldn't tie the ground. She finally, she finally let me down on her compound beside a Mercedes Benz. She dragged me to the other side of the car, which had the glass of the window completely yes. pieces. She insulted me, my parents and ancestors for breaking the glass of her husband's yes, car. Yes, like, what are you passport? Really who is that? Please turn off your mic. 20... No. I'm going to mute everybody for a minute. Just a minute, Ace. I'm going to mute everybody and unmute you, okay? Uh, even Ace, unmute yourself. All right. Okay. Thank apparently, you. Somebody was on. Apparently, I missed the bed, but I didn't miss the glass of the car. My eyes were wet with tears raining down my huge eyeballs down my shirt. I wept like a hungry child when the woman said she wasn't going to release me till my parents come to rescue me. After crying my heart out for almost 30 minutes, I heard a knock on the main gate to the compound. It was my mother. A lady in the house opened the gate for my mother. The moment I set eyes on her, there was an overflow of tears down my eyes. My mother introduced herself and inquired what crime I had committed. The woman of the house opened up the long and short of the offense. My mother pleaded, but they wouldn't listen. She questioned them how much it would cost to face the glass of the Mercedes Benz. The cost was mentioned. My mother looked at my face, looked back at the woman and dramatically began to weep. That was the shocker of the whole incident. My mother weeping. I knew, her of, I knew of her dramatic pride, but this time she seemed real. She knelt down, placed her right hand in the belly of, in the belly of the left of the left, and bitterly wept and pleaded. The tears that rained down her huge eyes were enough to soften the heart of the woman. My mother's cries didn't push any results, so she took off her African prince wrapper from her waist, lay on the cemented floor, and rolled like a barrel down a hill. It was indeed a scene. She made bitter references to which she made bitter references, which suddenly worked out to cause my release. The woman and her daughter finally consoled my mother when she claimed in her cry on the floor that if it wasn't for poverty, 
I wouldn't have been a stubborn child. I wouldn't say we were poor, but if my mother said we were at that instance, then we were. Our appeal fell on good heart finally and we were asked to leave before a change of mind. Soon as we exited the compound and the gate was shut behind us, my mother wrapped her head, smiled and asked me to go home with her. Moments ago, she was, she was weeping like, a, like the floodgate of heaven. The next, she was opposite. I was stunned. She took me home, consoled and advised me to be of good behavior, presented a bowl of jollof and chicken before me and asked me to enjoy. I, ante I anticipated a punishment, but here I was being treated like a prince. My mother topped it up with one pack of fruit juice and even I, if I was satisfied, I asked for another fruit juice and I was gladly given. The beautiful day came to an end as I went to bed with my mother's pampering hovering in my mind. For the first time that day, my mother put me to sleep with a bedtime story, soothing. 2 a.m. in the night, I was awoken by the lights in my room which came on without me switching it on and three, and three taps on my buttocks. I woke up looking tired with an unfocused sight till I finally grasped the image of the person who stood before me. She confidently held the cane, wore a furious face and breathed heavily. It was my mother, the angel I knew before bed I tend to be a devil before morning. I feared for my life. The moment, the moment where a chicken is fed, it was like the moment where a chicken is fed before being slaughtered flashed through my mind. She watched me, I watched her. That night, I carried my cross. And I am proud to say I wept better than my mother did earlier at the woman's house while she disciplined me at night. I felt the strokes on my flesh to the soul. In the morning, the same woman brought me breakfast in bed. Can you imagine? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Anna, do you have something for us before we go on to? Are you good for now? I'm good. I mean, I do, but let's move on. Let's catch up with time. Oh, all right. Okay. So. Um, we have about, uh, honestly, about half an hour left, and I'd like to open the floor for questions um, uh, from, from uh, our audience. And uh, uh, Nana, Nana I asked earlier, what is, what is your creation process? Um, um, I'll tackle that first. For me, it's, it's, it's an idea. Sometimes it's a picture. It's sometimes what I see, a word I hear, and uh, that sets it off. And I'd said it before. Um, I like my work to be more about finality, the finality of life, the finality of time, the fact that we don't have a lot of time, the fact that we are given a short time on this life to, sorry, on this earth to make something out of it. And that really uh, informs my work. Um, so I want the others also to talk about their creation process. I don't know if it's a creative process. I just, like I said, if something occurs to me, I write it. And then I'll yeah. sit down and, and kind of tweak it with the language and, you know, flesh it out, more ideas come up and I build I build around the structure. So normally I'll, have, I'll just have a structure, skeleton, something skeletal. And over time I build around it, work on the paragraphs, work on the language, the presentation, and then I put it out. So I mean, it's not as nice as Nana does his own, which comes with pictures and stuff. Mine is just thought ideas and fleshing it out. It's much more mundane than his. You know, the doctors write differently. Well, uh, you, know, you know, if a doctor writes, nobody can read it, right? So we have Joe and um, the Teddy and um, Nana. Uh, we are, we are, oh, and, and Anna, we are glad we can read what you write. <laughs> yeah. Can I ask um, my question, please? Yes. Go ahead, Stella. Okay. Please, my question is, um, how do you deal with writer's block? You know, in writing, it gets to a stage where you feel you're out of ideas or something. How do you deal with it? So let, let, me, let me talk on a writer's block. Personally, when, whenever I'm asked this question, I, I tell people I don't have a writer's block, which amazes many because for me, just like the writing process, I translate every situation I am in into writing. So even if I'm in a point where I can't 
or I'm not having any immediate point of reasoning to put in a story or a, a poem. The confusion or the muddled mind or that moment is even a moment of writing for me. I don't know for other writers, but then anything, anything else, anything that blocks me is, you can write about anything that actually um, blocks you from writing. You can translate that energy into a poem, basically. Yeah, uh, it's, it's so true. I also don't really have a writer's blog because um, if I'm not writing fiction, I'm trying to write a bit about medicine and then I also do photography. So to me, it's not just writing, it's, it's a creative process. And I move from one medium to the next mm. and one medium feeds into the other medium. So as long as you are creating, you are never blocked. Sure. Any other thoughts? Um, I think I would, I would, yes. I think I also have a, quite the same process. I also tell people that I haven't really experienced a writer's block because for me, not being able to write is also an opportunity to write. So I write about not being able to write. And uh, I see writing as an evolution in itself. Like, so the moment that I am not writing poetry, I ask myself, what other thing can I write about? And I'm someone who journals a lot. So if I'm not putting my works out there on social media, I am journaling in my journal until I'm ready to come out and, and go like, okay, fine. I'm ready to share this with the world. So often what I tell people is, if you have a writer's block, it's okay. You should leave it. Well, like I said, I am more of an inspirational writer. Something inspires me and then I write. If I am not in that zone, I don't force myself. I just let it be. And I think sometimes we have to let inspiration be like that because the more we force it, the more it turns something else. Probably maybe at that moment, that is that is what's your, your zone. You should tone it out or find a way to evolve that feeling into something. So yeah, it can, it can, it can always be something for you. Yeah. ABK, I mean, I, um, you want to, oh, sorry. Teddy. I'll say, yes, sometimes the oh. block is also the, the product of the um, disciplined writing. So people have like, and it's really a good habit to have a fixed writing pattern, you know, mm -hmm. choosing a specific time during the day that you write um, or a specific time during the week that you write. And it, sometimes it just happens that when you come to that period that you've allotted for yourself to write, there's nothing to, to write. And then we call it a block. Um, and that can go on for some time. But the truth is that it, it, it does seem like we write about what we care about. Um, and if we don't care significantly about what we're going to write, then it, it's difficult to write it. But I, I think we should use the block as an opportunity to find, to introspect and, and, and see whether we can find new ways in which we can be, you know, um, empowered to, to write. I think that if you write during a block and you produce something meaningless, maybe it was better not to force yourself to write it um, and just to use that time for introspection until, you know, inspiration will produce better writing. Yeah. Right. Um, ABK, you have a question. Go ahead and unmute yourself and toss it out there. All right. Um, thank you guys for, for your time. Got a quick question. Is there any topic or subject or um, anything that you would rather not write about? So are there some off-limit topics for any of you guys? Or you'd write about anything and everything? Okay, I'll go first. Yes, I will write about everything and anything. I, I think at the beginning of my exposure to wanting my creativity to evolve to whatever I wanted to be. I had, I used to face with a battle, especially on some of the topics that I, I was a little bit scared to talk about. And probably because of my personality and also because of where I come from and all those things. But over the years, one of the things that I have done is to find myself, um, to find the bravery and the authenticity to be present to write about the things that scares me. So what I do is the thing that scares me the most is the thing that I want to write about. Just a recent LGBT case that was in Ghana, 
I was quite skeptical when I wanted to write my mind and my, my take on the issue. I was quite scared, but I told myself, I am a writer, I am a crazy person. And if I am scared to share my narrative of what I think, then what is the point? And it helped me, I, I came out and through that process, I got to know of other people's narratives. And I did a lot of research because I had, I had my own idea what LGBT was about, but I had never really sat down to really read or get to know what they represent. It was just what I perceived or what people perceived, yes. So for me, the thing that scares me the most is mostly the thing that I, I rebel, let me use that word, to write about, yes. So I don't have anything that I'm scared to write about as in now in my life, yeah. Well, that, 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 that's a brave one, Joe. I, I write about Thank any you. and everything, but I decide <laughs> on, I write about any and everything, but I decide on which one to put in the public domain. Then yeah. Adazi has several times had to tell me, no, AC, you can't put this out because what I'm coming up with is probably too strong. And you think about it, what effect will it have? So I, you know, I kind of say, guys, whatsoever things are worthy, whatsoever things are of good report. So I kind of use that as my standard. So I do write about every and anything. In fact, some of the things I write, I put under systems password on where I won't disclose. Nobody ever knows it's there except me and probably my God, because some of them are pretty, uh, you know, pretty hard. But Person, like I yeah. said, you, you write, but ultimately you decide by your own editorial discretion which of them you'd want to make public. I had a very yeah. hard hitting one against the middle class in Ghana. And I showed it to Nanadazi and he said, no way, you're not going to publish this. So it's hiding somewhere. So you, you, you can blame him. It's his fault. It's all his fault. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Anna, do you have anything to say about that? there yeah um, um but personally i i also write about everything that i i want to write about i uh, i sometimes find it difficult to write about racial issues in the u.s um racial justice which which means a lot to me and uh it, it took me a while to gather the strength to write about that uh, because it tends to be a very um um dividing issue which it should not be um but unfortunately it is because it affects a lot of people and most people don't seem to realize that um, the, the criminal justice system here in the US is broken um, and it um, affects, it, it, it seems to affect a lot more black and brown people, but it, it gets a lot of poor people in its clutches and holds on. And uh, it's, it's taking me a while to want to write about that uh, because like I said, it's, very, it's a very sensitive topic. And yeah. one person who gives me strength actually to write about that is my daughter. So and the fact that I have a son. So yes, uh, so I think as, as writers, we need to find the, the courage to thread in those places that um, are scary for us because we oftentimes end up being the conscience of our society. Mm -hmm. um, um, Charles, get courage. Do you want to unmute and ask a question? Uh, thank you so much, Nana. Um, I want to find out from the introduction, I realized that almost all of you um, have something you, like you have a career, then at the side you write. Uh, let's say, for instance, Sewa in GHS or Agbeko in GHS who seeks to become a writer and want to do that solely. Is there, is there a Ghana we see in the future where Agbeko can focus on only his writing and make a living off it? Or he would have to, I mean, uh, get a job that puts uh, food on the table and at the side. Uh, right and just like you are doing so i just want to see pick your mind on that yeah interestingly this is a conversation i have a lot with my friend uh, ace um Kujo, uh, big ace about about mm -hmm. the, the arts and uh, ace ace is an accomplished guitarist and uh, keyboardist and uh, actually he could he he could be a music producer full time but the fact is, um, artists sometimes don't make enough to, to, to um, I would say, give them that artistic independence that is important for creation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that to me is the most important thing. Um, artistic independence is what allowed Prince to make so many songs that you know, he didn't care what he made. And I think the beauty of having another profession that supports you with artistic freedoms and it's, it's priceless. 
So for that and that alone, um, it took me a while to come to that conclusion. I think every artist should have something that pays the bills. Um, it gives you artistic freedom. Artistic freedom is an, it's, it's, it's very important. If you're lucky enough to be one of those writers who can support himself from his right and then hey, all well and good. But um, I think it's kind of it's kind of hard. I, I, I agree with you. I mean, there, there are a lot of writers, but um, you you probably get to hear about very few of them because if you go to any library or bookshop, you'd always discover a writer you've not heard of before. Uh, for me, Nana is right. Um, having a profession that feeds me allows me to allows me the luxury of my impatience. It allows me the luxury of my artistic and my artistic and creative side. So I I can get gather all the music equipment that I like in my basement and play as and when I feel like I can write what I think about because I know that there, 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 there are no recriminations that will hit my pocket, which is a very, a very important place. Um, so if you can, yes, but if you are gifted and you get the breakthrough and your writing is feeding you, great. But um, ultimately, a man has got to keep body and soul together, feed the family. I still believe that it's a man's primary responsibility to take care of his family. And so you got to go out there and get a job. And so if you can pursue a, a, a career that will provide the money that can then go into your writings. I mean, I, I wrote a book. I wasn't really, really interested in selling it, right? I gave the first 300 copies out for free. And I'm not even sure I've sold the, the rest. I have quite a bunch just sitting there. And I gave, I gave out quite a little bit because and I, I, I did an album. I printed copies of it and gave the three, first 350 out for free because... Really, I'm not into it for the money. I just wanted to do my own artistic expression. I spent the last two and a half years in the studio recording all kinds of music, uh, almost up, up, about 15 to 20 songs. I won't put them anywhere. I play them in my car and listen to it myself. You know, I'm, I'm no pressure to put them out there. I don't care. My music, I play my music in my car, listen to myself, and I'm happy listening to it. One day when That's I feel sufficiently all. crazy, I might put it out there. But, you know, it's because I, it's, it's a luxury I can afford to do. It's my, yeah. it's mine. But so I'll advise, look, get a, get a profession that feeds you, and then you can add that to it. But if you are blessed and lucky, and somebody's going to pay you for having fun, please take it and move along with it. That's what I'll say. And especially you know, from our geographical location, you really need a second profession. Yeah. But, but yeah. I'd, also say, I'd also say that the reason why we might ne never get somebody who will get to the point of getting a Nobel in literature, a Nobel Prize in literature, is because we just don't create the environment where somebody can be full-time writing. I mean, I think that the difficulty with having a profession and writing is the fact that whatever we do, the profession will get in the way of the writing and yeah. the writing will never develop yeah. to the extent that it would have developed without the profession. So I think that also for the people who have been able to you know, write and develop a profession, we should think about the responsibility we have to you know, find, you know, somebody who would be a pure writer and contribute to an environment that nurtures such a person. So that person can develop writing to, you know, the extent that we would never get to. And, and, and we also have the responsibility of advocating for our country to develop an incubator for such capacity. Because, I mean, for as long as people have to earn their living and write, we will never get the kind of, you know, writing that wins awards worldwide. I went to Ireland for um, a, a weekend and we we're just doing a round of Dublin. And then I realized Dublin, just Dublin has produced five uh, Nobel uh, literary writers. It's a small country, you know, just a few million people. But the thing is that they create an environment where a writer can maximize his or her um, capacity. And I would say, yes, um, unfortunately in our environment, we have to you know, have a, a career and then um, do the writing, um, a career to, to earn some money and stuff. But we should understand that then we will never have you know, 
the, the blessing of, you know, having a Ghanaian with a Nobel Literary Prize. Mm. Well, uh, thank, thank you all so much. Um, I think uh, if we, had, we don't have any other questions, I want to um, extend uh, my warmest gratitude to, to Joe, to Anna, to Denise. Oh, I see a hand raised. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Nanare, go ahead. Yeah, Doc, um, I just wanted to add to the contributions on the, uh, the question that Courage asked. And I, all, I just want to refer us to our historical past. So who are the, the leading um, uh, writers, African writers we've had in the past? So look at Chino Achebe, Soyinka, Ama Atedu, Ayikweyama. Even though you would say that they immersed themselves in the literary space, they were not living on the proceeds of book sales alone. So even if you get within that space, you realize that I always use the, the analogy, sorry, Anna, um, but the analogy of fufu uh, with soup. So if your, your book sales are the, are the fufu itself, you should focus on the soup, which is the auxiliary services around your writing. So you, you can get, um, um, uh, you know, uh, money from providing uh, other writing services, you know, uh, edit editorial services, um, doing um, uh, writing stuff for people. Ace was telling me recently about uh, something that could be done. He was asking me, do you have somebody who can write uh, biographies for funeral brochures uh, at short notice, for instance? So all of these guys, even our big yeah. names, have had auxiliary, auxiliary services around the writing that they do, either they are lecturing or they are editors and stuff like that. So just, just to put that in historical context. Thank you. Thank you so Thank you. much. Um, I think uh, Abdul Razak, Mohammed, go ahead and unmute uh, yourself and ask your question. Abdul Razak. Abdul Razak, go ahead. Oh, I think we. Uh, I, 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 I think he put, he put his hand down. Oh, okay. Um, well, in the in the absence of any other questions, I want to I want to say a big thank you to. Um, I want to say a very big thank you to Joe, to Anna, to Ebenezer, to Teddy, and to. Could you ace for uh, joining me today for this session? It's I think it's been awesome hearing all the pieces from diverse angles and. Uh, can, 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 I, can I ask a question? I know I, I, yeah. I know how, how I know I know how I got my name Ace. Evan, how did you get yours? <laughs> <laughs> Why did I suspect this? <laughs> um, <laughs> I didn't really suspect this coming. I didn't... <laughs> all right, so. I got, mine, mine was inspired by um, the American, American rapper Ace Hood. That was somewhere back 2000 and, 2009. Yeah. So I, got, I, I, I Googled the meaning of Ace and I realized, oh, this is something I could tag along with my, my writings. I mean, Ace means excellence. So I wanted that pedigree of everything that I write to have that excellence with my art and everything. So I quickly attacked it to my, to my name. And then since then it has been a back and forth with my dad on how to actually formalize it with my, with my actual name. I'm, I'm, I'm always having a back, back and front um, exchange with him to actually change my name or add the A to my official name. So that's how come I, I got my name. And then later I, I realized <laughs> The senior age himself. Uh, look, you're, yeah. you're, you're lucky. You chose it yourself. I didn't choose mine. My father gave it to me. And it has yeah. given me so much trouble. You have no oh. idea. I've been called everything. AC, you know, AC, SA, AK, AK, everything. I see. I mean, I'm called all, I've been called all kinds of things. So you are lucky. You you grew up and chose it yourself. I was inflicted with it. I just wanted to find out. Sorry, sorry. Oh, sorry. I, was, I, was very, but I just needed no to problem. know. At least he's no saying problem. I'm not. Yeah. And, hey, by the way, Ibn has this has this piece he did with the late uh, Emmanuel Bobier, which 
I, I would advise everybody to watch. I'll see if I can mm-hmm. uh, put it on my site. It's called Asasia. Um, uh, it's basically about Ghana. Um, and uh, it contains pictures and videos made by uh, Bobby Pixel. And uh, Ibn Ace does the voiceover over it. It's, it's gripping. It's, it's, it's really amazing. You guys need to see it. I'll put it on my on my timeline sometime today so that people can see it. It's really good. Thank you all so much for, for doing this. Um, it's a sincere pleasure, Nana. Yeah. Oh, I muted <laughs> myself, sorry. And, 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 uh, and the pleasure uh, of uh, all of us. I'll give everybody, I'll, re, I'll give everybody a, a minute or so to say a last word and then we can um, finish this. Anna, you've been lost for a while, so you go first. <laughs> No problem. Thank you so much for putting this together and for um, including me among, I feel uh, like now I can go request my passports to Ghana. Um, oh, yes. <laughs> maybe I can add Ace to my last name or something. Um, <laughs> but, uh, um, you know, I, I feel, um, I, I, as we've talked about before, Nana and I, I often feel like this uh, floating global citizen mm-hmm. and, and, and I genuinely do find home in, in community. So I'm so grateful to, to be part of this. Um, and Joe, uh, I, I think if you read a recipe for bread, I'd love to hear you read it. It's just so oh. inspiring how your voice comes across. Um, Thank you. And, and, the, and all of you who, really are creating stories and exposing us to to words the way that they're not put together in our language. So uh, Nana, please keep doing this. I'd love to come as an audience and just keep supporting this work. All right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so um, Teddy, you want to say a last word? Oh, just, just to say um, it's been a really good experience and I'm very grateful that you put this together um, we should do more of this, and I, I'm looking forward to hearing more from uh, Ebenez and uh, Joe, um, and 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 more discovered, you know, writers uh, bringing the magic of the word for us to to experience. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Joe, um, something. Your last word. Yeah, so I will also say that um, I'm like, it's a pleasure meeting the acquaintance of every single person. And the readings, even though they were different, but they were all saying, like, I could see this, the, like, it's saying, we are all doing different things, but not so different. And it's my pleasure um, meeting all of you, meeting you, Nana, meeting um, the big A's himself. I mean, I've heard about him, but I haven't seen him before. Like, it's really a pleasure meeting everyone and also your friends from the United States as well. So I'm, I'm, like it's just it's just something that I really love, and this is to Teddy. Teddy, since you are at um um they got I think the medical center, right? Yes, yes. Okay, so I'm also at Quest um okay. MDS Lancet. So probably maybe one day I'll just pass around and just say yes. hi to you. Very nice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey Benice, you want to say a last word? Yeah, it, it's it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure meeting everyone and um, meeting Anna tell her story from a different um, point of view, from a different world. And then the mixture, just like Joe said, the, the mixture of different stories and different perspectives makes it beautiful. Having everyone share their experiences and their, their thoughts on things that happen on your everyday life. It's, it's, it's great meeting everyone, Teddy, from the medical perspective. I've, I've turned on a couple of your works um, in recent times, and I, I'm actually taking notes on some of the things you write. With A's, A's much senior A's or big A's, let me put it. Much, much has been learned from you for over the, over the time. It, I've been a distant learner from your write-ups, and then I'm I'm glad to actually meet you on this platform and learn much from you as well. Nana Gansan, you are awesome. I mean, putting this whole thing together. I didn't know there was this much lineup. There was this much squad. Later, when I saw the lineup, I was like, hey, this is heavy. But then <laughs> it, it's, it's an honor meeting everyone. And then Joe, everyone, it, it's an honor meeting you all. Thank you. Okay. Good, your age. Your last Hi, word. Um, 
I'm humbled and flattered to be in the company of such um, auspicious people. Um, I like I like the readings. I heard things that have tickled me, and so I'll take with me. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for those who stayed to listen to us. Um, let's keep doing this, Nana. Thanks for doing uh, doing a great job. I tell my kids that I was in school with you for five years, and I don't remember how many times I spoke with you when we were in school together. But now I think that I, I speak with you more than most people on earth. That's how life. That's how life is. I mean, we're in a big school, so we kind of met in classes and fun and stuff like that. But now that we're grown, I mean, we're spending. You can see his gray hair is more than mine, and he's almost lost all his hair. I, I trust me, he didn't shave it. The hair fell. Out. I have hair. I have hair. It's just short. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, all the hair fell out. He didn't, he didn't I mean, like he didn't shave them. They, they left. They, they left from their own accord. Yeah, he still has some, but they are dying from loneliness. Very soon, oh. they won't be here at all. So, yeah. but, but that, that, that's how we go. Thank you, everybody. It's been great. It's been great time. Thank you so yeah. much. Just before we leave, Anna, great um, to meet you. Everybody, great to meet you. Too. Let's all think yeah. about India going through this 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 COVID COVID spike. Yeah. Um, that you are going through, whatever you do, just think of them and uh, stay healthy, guys. And uh, we hope to be able to do this again. Thanks, everybody, for coming. And uh, have a good rest okay. of the day. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.